<laughs> so our next speaker is uh, Daniel Podolsky from the Technion. And he will speak about collective modes in uh, quantum solids. Thanks. Okay, uh, well, I'd like to uh, begin by thanking uh, Moshe and Yoram for uh, organizing the school and for the opportunity to speak. Um, so what I'm going to be telling you about today is uh, something that's a little bit outside the uh, scope of the, uh, the school. Um, I'll, I'll be telling you, you know, the protagonist of uh, the talk is going to be helium, uh, which, uh, um, as you know, it's, it's characterized by two uh, main properties. One is that it's uh, very light. It's the second lightest atom after uh, hydrogen. And it's uh, very weakly interacting because it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, has a filled electronic shell. And so the interactions between two helium atoms are, are just weak Van der Waals uh, forces. And, uh, and so this makes it a very boring uh, element as far as chemistry is concerned. It doesn't react with anything, but it makes it very interesting as far as physics is concerned uh, because it has very unusual, many unusual properties. So, um, so the phase diagram of helium, uh, this is helium-4, uh, uh, looks like this. Uh, basically, helium, if, you, if you're at ambient pressure, uh, it does not solidify even if you go to uh, uh, a zero Kelvin. Um, so if you want to force it to solidify, you have to also apply uh, extra pressure. And uh, then when you do that, most of the time you land in this uh, hexagonal closed packed phase. But if you tune your temperature and pressure just right, then you end up in this little sliver of the phase diagram where uh, you have a, a body center cubic uh, solid. And uh, uh, BCC has, uh, um, you know, as you know, it's, it's a monatomic uh, Bravais lattice, and therefore uh, you would expect from the usual theory of uh, phonons that you should only have acoustic phonons in, in, this, in this solid. Now, experiments have been done um, about 10 years ago, uh, a little bit more than 10 years ago, where uh, these are inelastic neutron scattering experiments on, you know, people take, um, it is from the group of uh, Emil Polturak, where, the, where they took helium in, in a cell and uh, applied pressure and uh, solidified to get a single crystal. And then you do inelastic neutron scattering and you see these, uh, you know, you see these uh, three acoustic phonons. Um, but I'm not showing you all of the data. Um, you also get this extra mode, uh, which is an, uh, something that looks like an optical phonon. Okay, and so uh, sort of um, here I'm showing you the, uh, the actual, what the data looks like. So this is a number of counts, the log of number of counts versus um, energy. So here you see, for example, the longitudinal phonon and you see this extra bump, which is a new excitation. Now here you might not be convinced that it's two different excitations, but if you sit at the Bragg, uh, at the Bragg vector, then, uh, then you no longer get acoustic phonons. And here you get a very clear peak that tells you that you have an extra a optical excitation. Okay, so sort of the question is, what is this ex a, a optical excitation? Um, now, uh, you can actually do uh, more than that. You can look at uh, different, uh, you, when, when you do neutron scattering, you can look at different polarizations, different uh, directions. And, um, and so, sorry, I um, went the wrong way. Um, so this is the data that I showed you within the 110 uh, direction. But you can also look at uh, transverse polarization in the 100 direction, and then you get this optical mode that seems not to disperse. Uh, and uh, you can also do a different direction where you see both a dispersing mode and a non-dispersing mode. And, uh, and I should add also that people, so these are different experiments by the same group, but there's also experiments done by a different group on uh, HCP phase uh, where they see more optical modes than what you would expect from, because HCP is not a, uh, a monatomic barbellate, so you also get optical modes there, but you get more optical modes than what you would expect from uh, mode counting. So, so my talk is basically about trying to give a model that explains what these modes are. So, um, so let's just uh, take a step back and, uh, and, and, and see where our intuition that uh, in a Barbet lattice we should only have uh, a, a, a acoustic modes, where does that come from? So that's you know, the harmonic theory of solids where we say, uh, you know, a, a solid is, you know, has uh, atoms at some equilibrium positions, but really the atoms are not strictly there. They have small fluctuations U from their equilibrium positions. And usually we assume that these fluctuations are, are, are small relative to the distance between atoms. And that allows us to do um, an, a, a, an expansion to second order in these displacements. So this is a harmonic part of the interaction energy. And usually, so from here, if we have a monatomic Rabbit lattice, we can just do a Fourier transform and get some three by three matrix that gives us our three optical modes, so we get our acoustic phonons only. But, um, but we know that there are corrections to the harmonic theory. There are terms that go like U cubed, U to the fourth, et cetera. 
Um, but typically these are, are small because we have a, a rule of thumb called the Lindemann criterion, which says that when the root mean square displacement uh, of the atoms is about 10% of their interatomic uh, distance, the crystal melts. And so usually the fact that we are always in the solid uh, below this Lindemann criterion gives us some expansion parameter that allows us to, 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 you know, to basically uh, 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 say that these terms are more important than the unharmonic terms. Okay. Um, now, um, I want to point out that basically helium does not fit this uh, a paradigm, okay? So I want to give you some evidence for that. So the, first of all, um, if, you, if, you look at, um, if you look at, a, let's say that you were to freeze all the helium atoms except one, okay? And ask what's the potential that that atom uh, sees. So basically it sees the Van der Waals potentials from all the nearest neighbors. Um, but uh, basically because, of, of, because helium is so light, um, there's a lot of zero point motion and, and the atoms don't sit at the minima of their nearest neighbors. They actually sit, so here I'm showing you basically the sum of two Van der Waals potentials. Actually, a, 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 a given helium, a, helium atom actually sits at a local maximum in the potential, okay, if you were to freeze all the other atoms. So this is to compare it, for example, with what you see in, in, in argon, where you see, you know, basically that every atom sits at the minimum of the potential generated by its neighbors. So you, expect, you can expect that an atom that lives in this potential has a lot of freedom to move around. Um, so this is uh, another piece of evidence. So if you look at the, uh, at the Lindemann, Lindemann parameter for helium-4 in the BCC phase, it's about 30%, okay? Much more than the 10% where you would usually expect to see melting, okay? So basically the atoms are fluctuating uh, everywhere. And another piece of evidence um, that uh, anharmonicities are very uh, strong in helium is that the harmonic theory does not give the correct uh, velocities for the acoustic phonons. There's an entire field called self-consistent phonon theory just to calculate the phonon velocities of helium, okay? Because you have to take into account these anharmonicities to get the correct phonon velocities. So, um, so basically, uh, if we want to think about, about helium as masses connected by springs, what we know is that, this, that we have very strong nonlinear terms in the spring. You know, we cannot just keep the linear spring constants. We have some nonlinear terms as well. And this, in principle, uh, can give multiple solutions. Um, you know, so if we have n equations with n, n linear equations with n unknowns, well, then we expect n normal nodes. But if we have nonlinear equations, in principle, we can get more modes than, uh, than the naive counting. Of course, this doesn't tell us how to solve it, uh, but uh, uh, so, so, so basically what we're looking for is some way to construct a linear theory uh, for these optical modes. So, um, okay, so basically the point of view that I'm gonna take is this. Uh, so usually when you have a, uh, when you think about a crystal, you know, a classical crystal, uh, you think about having, you know, atoms at positions that are basically delta functions in, in so here's density versus uh, X or something. So you expect to have um, very sharp atoms that are you know, very sharply localized at their, at their positions with maybe some small uh, fluctuations. And if you look at this in, uh, in Fourier space, then you also get a train of Bragg peaks that essentially does not decay or decays very weakly uh, given, and the decay is given just by the width of these uh, peaks. But if you have something that looks like helium, okay? So helium, here I'm showing you what a charge density with 30% uh, Lindemann, Lindemann parameter looks like, okay? So if you now look at the Fourier transform of this, you get that the first uh, Bragg peaks, the primary Bragg peaks are much larger than the secondary. So these Bragg peaks decay very uh, quickly. And so, um, so maybe the right thing to do is to write a dynamic theory for just the primary Bragg peaks, okay? Ignoring all the higher uh, uh, Bragg peaks. So, um, and basically, this is paramount to treating uh, solid helium uh, four as a, as a three-dimensional charge density wave, okay? Um, and why does that help us? Because in a charge density wave, we can get very naturally uh, gap modes. So here I'm showing you what are, in a one-dimensional charge density wave, what are the collective modes. You get modes that are associated with fluctuations in the phase of the charge density wave, which are the phase zones. Uh, which are basically the acoustic phonons. But in addition, you have the possibility to modulate the amplitude of the charge density wave, and these are gapped excitations uh, uh, that are called the amplitudons, okay? So, uh, so the idea is to do this uh, for a 3D uh, CDW. So here, our order parameter 
is the density uh, relative to the average, so the density modulation. And um, in, at least in the case where uh, the order parameter is small, we can do an expansion. We can write some, so I, I must say this treatment is, is, is completely phenomenological, okay? I'm just, uh, uh, I'm not giving you a microscopic derivation, but um, you can write down a, a ginsburg landau free energy where you expect that each time that you go to higher and higher powers in the, in the density modulation, if the density modulation is weak, uh, the higher powers are less important. Uh, each, each higher power is less important than, the, uh, than its predecessor. And so I will just stop at, at row to the fourth. Um, and so if you, if you Fourier transform this, well, this is what it looks like uh, in, in, in Fourier space. Um, uh, but uh, I didn't tell you what is this kernel. So this, this kernel that enters into the quadratic uh, uh, part of the free energy is the, is the static susceptibility. And um, here, uh, basically, we're writing the free energy approaching from the liquid. So, um, so if we are in the liquid phase, we have something that looks sort of like a roton minimum at, at the momentum of the charge density wave. And as we get closer and closer to the, to the uh, charge density wave, these minima uh, get closer and closer to zero. And when they reach zero, um, we condense basically at, at these wave vectors and we get a, a charge density wave transition. So, um, so basically, uh, the question is what, which type of solid do, do we get? Um, there's a very nice analysis done by uh, in these two uh, sort of classic papers, uh, where it show, what, what they showed is that you always get a BCC phase when you do this type of analysis, just stopping at, 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 uh, at the row to the fourth. And the reason for that is that, so we, we said that basically we, the, the quadratic term is more important, than, uh, more important than the cubic, which is more important than the uh, quartic. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to satisfy, minimize the, uh, the, the quadratic term. So minimizing the quadratic term means that we want to condense in some wave vector of mod that's of uh, you know, uh, absolute size g, but that gives us still uh, a sphere, yeah? Why is there no derivatives of density? The, uh, they, they, they're here because rho is, is k dependent. Uh, so so all, the, all the derivatives are here. So, so when I showed you that, that, uh, that uh, chi of k, that basically includes all the derivatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, um, and so basically what you want to do is you want to condense where the roton minimum is, so to speak, it's not really a roton minimum, but where, 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 where the susceptibility touches zero, which is on a sphere um, of, of, of radius g. Uh, but we still do not know exactly which pattern we want on the sphere. We could condense at many different points. Uh, so to figure out where we want to condense, we go now to the cubic term. Uh, and the cubic term, you see that there's this uh, a, a momentum conserving delta function that basically wants to maximize the number of triangles whose momenta add up to zero, like here. Okay. And so if you look at all the uh, different Bravais lattices, uh, you find that the one that maximizes the number of triangles is BCC. So, uh, so this is an argument that in this type of uh, theory, you always get a BCC crystal. Uh, okay. So. But, what we, but we don't really want to under, uh, study the, 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 the crystal. We want to study uh, its normal modes. So, so we need to add some dynamics to, to our theory. So, and basically, um, uh, so now we want to look at the dynamical ginsburg landau theory. And this is the lowest order term dynamics that you can add. You cannot, you cannot add something that's linear in time derivatives, unless you have dissipation, but I can discuss that later if somebody's interested. Uh, but this is basically the, the, the most uh, dominant term in the dynamics. And, um, and so now the thing to do is basically, uh, so we have that our order parameter, so we have our mean, some mean field value for the density at each one of these Bragg vectors, that's this rho i bar. And we add some small fluctuations, which are supposed to be slow in space and time. And, uh, and, and what we do is uh, we enter this into our, our free energy and we uh, solve the linearized Euler-Lagrange equations. And basically what we get uh, if we do that is that, so we have six pairs of reciprocal lattice vectors and this gives us uh, therefore 12 modes. Okay, so, um, so this is what the uh, uh, modes look like. So of course we have to get three which are acoustic and so the, all, the other nine are, are optical, sorry. Uh, keep on going the wrong way. Um, so this is what the uh, uh, dispersion relation uh, looks like in one particular direction 
uh, in the in the uh, uh, in the zone. Um, this is in a, in a different direction. You already see here that something very nice happens, which is in this T100 direction, we get a non-dispersing mode, which is uh, uh, which is also something that I showed you in the in the experimental data. Um, uh, but uh, before we I discuss that, let's let's just first uh, figure out why do we have degeneracies? Because we, here we have all sorts of modes that are degenerate, and uh, and why is this mode flat? Okay, so. Uh, so first, to understand the degeneracies, we have to look a little bit at the group theory of the problem. So we have an underlying uh, cubic symmetry, so all of our solutions have to uh, transform as reducible representations of the cubic group. And this is how you, uh, this is some visual representation of, of all the 12 solutions. Uh, so here we get, uh, these are the three acoustic modes, and all the other ones are a, a, a optical a modes. Um, so just to visualize what these things look like, so so this is the uh, so the simplest to uh, visualize optical mode is this so-called breather mode. So here, what I'm showing you is the uh, density uh, on one. You know, I'm cutting one slice. Or, or, so this is x and y, where I am cutting uh, one slice of uh, BCC. So going through one uh, layer of atoms, and what you see is the density. In 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 in, 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 the, in the every single um, uh, unit cell is undergoing oscillations. Um, uh, all of them are undergoing the same oscillation. So this is a Q equals zero mode. Okay, um, but basically you can understand this. So this is sort of a three-dimensional analog of the amplitude on mode that I show you for a one-dimensional charge density wave. Basically the density is becoming sharper and less sharp, uh, but it's doing it at Q equals zero. Okay, um, but you also have other solutions. So, for example, these are the uh, quadrupole modes, uh, where what the density is doing in each unit cell is it do, it's, it's undergoing some type of uh, you know a motion like that, okay? Um, and so, and you can uh, visualize the other modes as well. But uh, wh one thing that's interesting here is that this this quadrupolar mode. Uh, uh, the quadrupolar mode where in the x the x y quadrupolar uh, quad quadrupolar mode, which is what's shown here, if this is x and y. Um, that one does not have uh, 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 its dispersion in the z direction goes as q to the uh, as, 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 as uh, q to the fourth, not as q squared, uh, because basically you can you can uh, if you if you stir this a little bit, you can convince yourself that uh, the the uh, the coupling between one layer and the next uh, basically there's no coupling to lowest order in the in the distortions between one layer and the next and so and so therefore you get something that's non dispersing in the z direction okay um, so um, okay so i show you that there's nine uh, a, a, a gap modes so the question is which one is the lowest gap mode that depends on the details of the of the ginsburg landau theory meaning there's one parameter there's a crossing at one particular value of the ginsburg landau parameters where you go from the breather mode being the lowest to this uh, quadrupolar mode being the lowest. Uh, in our theory, that's the only qualitative fe feature that depends on the per precise value of the parameters, okay? Everything else uh, is qualitatively the same no matter what parameters we choose. So, um, so um, but basically we get that it's either the breather or the, or the, or, or the quadrupolar mode. So, um, now, if we want to uh, a, a compare with uh, neutron scattering, then uh, we, we need to compute the dynamical structure factor. And so this we do by, uh, by basically quantizing our Ginsburg-Landau action, promoting it to some quantum theory. And then we can uh, 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 compute this. Uh, and one nice thing is that uh, uh, the, our, our, our structure factor satisfies the SOM rule which means that even though we're shifting some spectral weight from the acoustic modes to the optical modes, we're not violating the total spectral weight of the system. We're not adding spurious degrees of freedom, okay? So you might, for example, have said, well, what if you had included, instead of just um, the, the, the primary back vectors, you had included uh, some further back vectors. That would have changed the you know, number of modes, but the total spectral weight would not, have, would not have changed, and these extra modes that we would have added would have been probably at very high energies. So. So they would not have been, you know, they, they would have very small spectral weight, essentially. So, uh, so this is some type of self consistent, so, some some type of consistency check on our theory. Uh, and um, so now I'm, I just want to show you. Uh, so here I'm showing you the uh, the our, our our spectrum in the one zero, one, one zero direction. Uh, 
uh, versus the one one zero direction experiment. And uh, again, you shouldn't, you know, the, anyways. So, and so you see here we get this uh, dispersing mode in this direction. Um, whereas if we look at the T100 direction, we get this non-dispersing mode just like uh, uh, in experiment. And uh, I should say that the solid lines here are the ones that they've been colored solid because that's where the structure, the dynamical structure factor is non-zero. So the, the dotted lines have uh, vanishing uh, a, a structure factor due to symmetry reasons in these directions. So that's why you know this should be compared to that. Uh, in, in the top plot, the fact that you see here three lines is because these, these are not. This is not polarized data. This is this is just showing a single polarization. So so here you should only compare the solid lines uh, on the left panel to to what's seen in the experiment. Okay, so. Um, okay, so we wanted to supplement our analysis with some uh, uh, numerics, and so we did uh, a ab initio uh, simulations. These were done by uh, Snir Gazit, who is, uh, was a student at Technion, is, is now a postdoc at Berkeley. So what he did is, uh, so basically he took 2,000 uh, helium atoms and put them in a box with uh, periodic boundary conditions. and. Um, and, and, and he did have initial simulations. Basically, the interaction between helium atoms is very well characterized. It's known to be described by this, uh, as this potential, uh, which is some slightly modified version of uh, the usual van der Waals. Um, so he basically took this potential that's, known, uh, well, that's well known. He chose the experimentally known density and the experimental temperature. So this is a fully ab initio calculation. Um, and uh, so here I'm showing you, you know, basically uh, uh, the position of his atoms in one slice of space. Uh, but basically what you see is this meandering uh, of the atoms. So, so notice here that, that each atom, uh, you, you can see that this is in a, a solid phase if you look very far. But you see that each atom meanders quite a bit. And this is basically going back to this idea at the beginning that, 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 that helium has very large zero point motion. Um, and uh, in fact, if you were to look very you know, locally at this picture, uh, you would not be able to tell the difference between the fact that this is a solid and a liquid, because liquid helium looks the same f f if you look at it f from, from close by. Only when you look at it globally do you realize that it's in a solid phase. So, um, uh, but anyway, so this is, this is uh, from the simulations, and, and, and SNEER computed the, um, the dynamical structure factor. And uh, of course, when you do quantum Monte Carlo, you have to do the simulations in imaginary time. And uh, that's the, that's the uh, downside. So then you have to do uh, uh, numerical analytical continuation to get uh, a real time dynamics. Uh, but uh, basically, when you do that, this is, this is what you get. So here, what I'm showing you is um, where we get uh, in, the, in the quantum Monte Carlo a peak as a function of momentum. Uh, so you see that those are the red dots. The blue dots are experimental data uh, for the L110 uh, 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 mode. So you see that the acoustic phonon lies on top of the experiment. But now if you look at, uh, at the Bragg vector, you see that there's one extra point, which is not at zero energy, which is what you would, would have to get if you had only acoustic phonons. And this extra point is um, this is what this, the structure factor looks like at, that, at, at the Bragg vector. So, so we basically get from the numerics, you know, this optical mode, which is uh, so. This is some type of confirmation from numerics that uh, that there should also that there should be these optical modes. Now, uh, there's a question though because the energy where we get the mode is half an MeV which is about half of the lowest uh, mode that's seen in, uh, in experiment. So, um, so basically there's uh, two possibilities. Uh, uh, one of them is that the energy, we're not capturing it right because doing analytical continuation is a very messy business and getting um, you know, qu quantitative numbers from analytical continuation is, 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 is tricky. Uh, but the other possibility is that perhaps there is a mode actually at this energy that, uh, that has not been reported in experiment. And uh, this is something that I've uh, been in, in contact with the people who did the experiments in neutron scattering. Uh, and, um, and what they said is basically that they did see uh, a feature at this energy, but the problem is that when you're st standing at the Bragg vector, um, if you're at low enough, if you're if you're not at high enough energy, then you get a lot of contamination from the from the uh, elastic Bragg peak, and so 
uh, sort of the analogy is that if you're looking at the sun, you know, and you want to see a star next to it, um, you know, you, you have to put something to block that. And, uh, and so basically, uh, basically they have a lot of, uh, a lot, uh, you know, the, 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 the signal from the elastic peak is orders of magnitude larger than the inelastic peak. So they basically threw out the data because they, 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 they think it's not, uh, you know, they could not say that it was uh, significant, but uh, it's something that, uh, that they're now interested in, in checking uh, more carefully. But one has to do new experiments to check that. Um, and, uh, and, and so, well, in, in any case, so, so in summary, um, what I try to show you is that um, in helium, uh, the harmonic theory does not work because there is very large zero point motion. However, if we look at, um, at these, uh, if we think about it as a charge density way, we can build a new sort of linear theory uh, for these uh, optical modes. And um, the quantum Monte Carlo finds these optical modes, but at that lower energy than experimentally observed. So it's not clear if it's an artifact of the numerics or not. And the prediction, as you see in the analysis, there wasn't anything very specific about helium other than the fact that there is very large quantum fluctuation. So, so this should also, uh, this physics should also apply in, uh, in, 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 in maybe in solid helium-3 uh, or other 2D and 3D charge density wave systems. So thank you for your attention. In the phase diagram, uh, most of the area was HCP and not BCC. That's right. Why, why is that? Yeah, no, so pr presumably, uh, you know, so presumably, if, uh, so this, this, uh, a, um, so this analysis really relies on the order parameter being, in some sense, weak. So, because otherwise you, you get five to the, uh, you know, row to the fifth, row to the sixth. I believe that, I mean, I do not know why it, it's weaker, but, but my speculation is that that sliver of the phase diagram where you have uh, a BCC is, is, is very close to where you get this meeting of the superfluid and normal phase, phase transition. And there could be these this, uh, fluctuations that might soften the, the, the solid order parameter, but that's speculation. Uh, uh, in any case, you know, the, um, uh, uh, so, so you know, so, but at least experimentally, it's, it looks like the fact that you, you know that you only get BCC near to the transition. Um, I, 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 you know, it could be due to due, due, due to the extra fluctuations, sort of softening the the solid so order. In the upper part there is a direct transition from the normal to the HCP. Yeah, yeah, but you say this is a strongly first order transition. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the thing is that. Um, okay. Well, if there were okay, uh, what well, I mean, I, I experimentally uh, usually when people look for super solid phase, they look actually in the HCP at very low temperatures, because you know here you also have large thermal fluctuations. Uh, you know, this is already 1.6 Kelvin, so. Uh, uh, but um, also, for example, w numerically, one thing that we did. Uh, Sneer looked at exchange paths in the in the quantum Monte Carlo, and basically you you get very very few exchange paths. Like uh, you know one out of every ten to the fourth atom, you know on average does an exchange path. So if you were to have a superfluid density, it would have to be very very small, uh, based on that. But uh, yeah, but experimentally nobody has seen super solid in, in the BCC phase of helium uh, four. Yeah. Do you do you allow for dislocations? Is it known how? Well, not in our, not in our, uh, in our Ginsburg land, uh, we, we, we don't take that into account at all. Uh, in the, in the Abinicio, you know, it's Abinicio and it takes everything into account in principle. Uh, uh, now, but you're asking whether, whether, uh, whether the, this could be some type of dynamical dislocations that are giving you the optical mode or, or something like that. Uh, uh, I don't know if I, I don't know if a dislocation would be sufficiently mobile to get a dispersion relation, you know, because uh, dislocations typically don't have a hard time moving, and uh, so so you know so perhaps for a completely non-dispersing mode, maybe that could be something like that. But the dispersing modes, I think, is very hard to explain with dislocations. So, yeah. So let's take the speaker again.